Welcome to the Let's Get Entrepreneurial podcast, your go-to resource for navigating the world of entrepreneurship. In today's episode, we have the privilege of hosting Dave Rendall, a renowned expert in the field of scenario planning. We dive into the concept of scenario planning and how it can help entrepreneurs navigate uncertainty and make informed strategic decisions. Join us as we unravel this powerful tool and gain valuable perspectives on preparing for the future in this captivating episode. The Let's Get Entrepreneurial podcast is your ultimate launch pad for igniting ideas and skyrocketing your entrepreneurial dreams. Tune in, buckle up, and let's unleash the entrepreneurial spirit within. Your two hosts will be Professor Gary Palin and serial entrepreneur Ryan Budden. Hello, Ryan. How are you doing today? I'm doing brilliantly. What about you? Uh, having a good day. Before we get into the content, today is a very special episode. This is episode one of season two. Yeah, that's exactly right. Two years of us doing this. That's amazing. Just a year ago, we started this, and I had no idea how much it would explode. No, nor did I. I just thought we were recording some fun conversations, and look what it's turned into. We have 72 different countries that have listened to our episodes over the past year. Yeah, isn't that incredible? Surprise the hell out of me. I've got to tell you, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> this podcast makes us sound pretty smart too, which is great. Editing is wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> Today, I wanted to do something different. About two years ago, I believe it was right at the beginning of the lockdown with COVID, I was videoing interviews for my students because we had to move 100% online very quickly. I have a very good friend who's a world leading expert in the concept of scenario planning. So I interviewed him. As I use this interview every semester, the students absolutely adore it. And like the content is very deep. We haven't done this before, so we'll try it out. Is you and I can watch his video along with the audience watching or listening. And then we'll stop it at a couple points and we'll interject some of our thoughts on the takeaways. How's that sound like the game plan? Yeah, pretty good. We can easily highlight what people can take away from the video just in case it's missed. For sure. Okay, let's share this and see what happens. Hello, Dave. Thanks for joining us in discussing scenario planning for my students. Before we get into the content area, I was wondering if you would just give us a brief background of yourself. The Dave Rendall story in the Cliff Note version. I see the Cliff Note version takes three hours. <laughs> My name is David Rendall. I was born in Rangoon, Burma. At that time, it was a province of India under the British Empire. Here was one of twins, born in 1934. I started my second childhood, by the way, at the age of 70. So I'm quite an adult right now. My brother was born 11 minutes earlier. He always claimed he was the older and I claimed I was the older. And that is part of scenario planning. Always challenge an assumption. I challenged that assumption. I said, I was conceived first. <laughs> I was born later, but I was conceived first. And so you have two scenarios here, each one claiming to be the elder. In 1942, war broke out and my father, because of his anglicized name, Rendall, the British said, we can't allow a man called Rendall to be left behind. So we got into this boat. It was a boat escorted by destroyers. And we got to the middle of the Bay of Bengal. Storm broke out, the destroyers temporarily went out and a torpedo hit the ship from a Japanese submarine. Women and children, that's my two little girls who were born after me, were allowed in a lifeboat. Me and my twin brother and I said, had to jump into the Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal, which is one of the most shark infested bays <laughs> in the world. And we treaded water. In the beginning, it sounded good, but all of a sudden, my father said, you can't taste that water, sons. You will vomit. It's salt. So we had to go and my mother's boat would somehow come close. We would hold on. And the only way we could get water is she had a little water. She put it in there, moisten her mouth. 
and then put that towel in our mouths. That's how we survived. Fortunately, the torpedo was a dumb one. It didn't destroy the ship. Within about 24 hours, we got back into the ship once they had dismantled it. We landed as refugees in there, but my father was known as a very good physicist. So he became the associate of the only Indian Nobel Prize winner in physics, Sir C.D. Raman. There we lived. It was quite a humbling experience for my parents. For me, well, we lived in a small place. There were four of us and two others. And that's where I first learned strategy. It was about the age of 11 and 12. I had an objective. My father used to ride a bicycle to work. There's one bicycle. He didn't even know how to ride that bicycle. He'd have to stand on a stool to sit on it and then get pushed. He'd fall off the bicycle on the other end. <laughs> he was one of those intellectuals. And the principal focus of me and my twin brother is who gets to ride daddy's bike when he comes back from work at six o'clock. The strategies one developed is amazing. I would paint different scenarios of how I would get my brother out of sight. And so I'm really born to be a scenario planner. <laughs> it is no accident that I took it up. Well, from that time onwards, we went back to Burma. My father was a lecturer in physics. He was now an associate. He wrote one of the papers of C.D. Raman, who got the Nobel Prize. And it is today known in physics as the Randall Raman effect in physics. We came back and we were in a Burmese school. We didn't understand Burmese, but my father was very well known there. And we had to write an exam for entrance to the university. And he says, you must write a paper in Burmese, a language which my father never spoke, <laughs> my mother did, and I had barely understood the alphabets. And suddenly a teacher came into the room, the man who was going to evaluate the tests. And he said, Saya, Saya means good teacher. Don't worry about your sons. Let them just write their name in Burmese and I'll pass it as competence. And he said that in front of me. The next thing we know is my father takes a job 2,000 miles away in a predominantly Hindu area called the Birla Institute of Technology and Science. It was remote from civilization and he went there. And then he called me and my brother. He said, do you know why I did this? He said, never allow yourself to be corrupted either by power money or influence. Your integrity is the one thing you have. You know what I'm sacrificing to teach you that lesson of integrity. Because from now on, you'll say, my dad did it. He got me there. I graduated, took my master's degree, got married in 1962. I was going to come to either MIT. I was applying for fellowships and I got the best scholarship really was the University of Purdue, although MIT was intending to give me a scholarship. And then I get a call from my wife that my daughter is with polio. Well, I came home, I looked, they said she'll never walk again. There was no insurance I had that could possibly make me survive in the United States. I couldn't leave my children and family behind. We went to England. And I thought I could get a good job after all. I had qualifications. And, and then I found that the best paying job I could get was an assistant somewhere of teaching at about 600 pounds. And I saw a notice outside saying, laborers wanted. The amount of money staggered me. It, the equivalent with all the butter, et cetera, was 16 to 1800 pounds a year, three times. I said, hey, I'm going to be a laborer. <laughs> it's a good living. So I became a laborer. There was a cafeteria. And all these guys who were studying for the university exams and sitting in guilds and all that were studying. And I saw one guy. He was working a problem in Boolean algebra. I said, oh, sir, he was one of the supervisors. I said, oh, sir, you're doing that some wrong. He turns to me and he says, what the hell do you know? I'm this torn clothes almost and working in the 
underground facility of tables. I said, sir, it's not what I know. It's what you know, and you don't know what you're doing. He turned around, he said, what the heck? I said, listen, this is a very special type of equation. It's a trick question. This is how you solve it. The next day, a whole group of students came around me. We understand you know mathematics. I said, yeah, it's one of my occupations. So I started, my boss found out, and all of a sudden, the guy who was there in charge, his name is Chapman, I still remember, he called me in. He said, I understand you know technology and electronics. I said, yes. He said, there's a thousand test sets here. The man who was supposed to test it is indisposed. By the way, in England, this means he's too drunk to come to work. Can you test it? So it's overdue, I'll give you a week. So I took it, I took the test set, looked at the instructions, tested them all in two days and handed them. He says, I gave you one week. I, said, I had nothing else to do, I might as well finish it. Next day, the man who was in charge of that test rejected the whole lot. He does a sample test of 50 tests, said so they're all wrong. My boss called me, he says, listen, is this how you do work? The whole thing got rejected. I said, well, sir, I did what I was supposed to do with the test sets. He said, okay, do it again. I was about to tell him I'm going to get the same results. <laughs> it's only an idiot who does the same thing again, expecting different results. <laughs> However, I went back and I talked to myself. Maybe the test set they had is different from mine. So I went and approached the boss there and I said, sir, can I have a copy of the circuit diagram of that test set? He says, please make an application triplet. We'll send it to the office. This is proprietary post office material. That is called regulation at work. And believe you me, regulation is more dangerous than innovation. And I said, well, you know, I'm just trying to find out. I said, I have to put my qualifications here and who I am. I'm saying labor of British post office. Is that what I have to put down? So anyway, I then decided to go to the guy who I had taught Boolean algebra. I said, you are in charge of the board. I want a copy of that circuit diagram. He said, I heard the boss tell you no. I said, well, the boss didn't ask you to solve a Boolean algebra problem thought for a moment. He said, seven o'clock in the evening, you come out, I'll give it to you. But tell no one. I took it, looked at it. Sure enough, there was a difference. It was a minor difference. It was a Winbridge oscillator with vacuum tubes. So I went to the store, got some vacuum tubes from there, put it in. The next morning, called up my wife. We didn't have a phone, by the way. My daughter was being treated in Harley Street. That was my objective of coming in the first place. <laughs> I was focused. That was not my occupation. Treating my daughter was the occupation. So I came back, did a test run of the whole thing in a day. For that particular test, it took no time. One day later, I handed it back. And Chapman turns around and says, it's got one day. I said, yes, sir. It was tested and it passed. Now I was informed by my boss to realize he said, sometimes you're so lazy, you don't do it right once. So I, why do I tell him anything? It was beneath my dignity. <laughs> After all, he was less qualified than me. <laughs> so I kept quiet. I said, yes, sir. He said, you can take the day off tomorrow. Next day, Crawford, 6 eight, walks in. He said, who did those tests? So Chapman looks up, stands up, and he says, I'll call you. I was standing near him, so I said, I did it, sir. I said, you did? Now, what did you do? I said, was I supposed to have done anything? So he turned to me, he says, you know, you're one smart, hell of a smart guy. I said, why? He said, you don't want to answer the question, so you ask a question in return. <laughs> you know, that's a strategy I learned years later that Gary Palin employs. <laughs> You ask him a question, he answers you a question. That's the truth, Dave. <laughs> and so I, I said, well, I changed the test set. He said, you changed the test set? Why? I said, because it didn't match his test set. 
I said, how did you know? I said, well, I found out. He said, there's no record of your looking for a diagram. It's all in the records. I said, I, how can I get this guy into trouble? I said, I pinched it. He said, you pinched it? He said, never mind that. Let's go. They look behind the set and look behind the set. I said, if you want, you can fire me because I'm not going to say any more. My lips are sealed. <laughs> he said, calm down, calm down. We have for the last six months, this was the last set of between France, between Paris and London, we had put up towers. This was the set was transmitting signals and receiving them. They never happened. And we are trying to find out why it isn't working. This is the first set that's working. And so we want to know why. We have done vicious tests in our laboratories to determine the cause. I said, so it's much more simple. <laughs> They're using wrong measurements between this. That's the second art of scenario planning. Always question results. Always question. Never have a group of people who agree. Scenario planning is not for choirs telling the pastor where to go. It is the art of disagreeing without being disagreeable. That's what something America needs to understand also. The art of disagreeing without being disagreeable. It also tells you another story. If I agree with you, that makes two of us that are wrong. <laughs> that was about the first 15 minutes or so, Ryan. Any major takeaways you picked up? Yeah, a couple of major takeaways on this section. The first was always challenge outcomes. He had a funny way of talking about that with him and his sibling rivalry on who was born first. And funny enough, I'm also a twin and we challenge each other on who was born first as well. I've never heard his explanation of how he could have been first. So I think that I'm going to add that one to my quiver. Excellent. Dave is quite a storyteller. He's a great example of getting content across with the art of storytelling. I have a standing rule. He's an incredible public speaker. I refuse to follow him on the stage. There's no way I can top him. <laughs> it's very nuanced, right? If you're paying attention, the nuggets are there, but he blends all of it together very well. Yeah, definitely. You have to pay attention to pick up the nuggets of gold. And that's actually the method of which I will share with my students. The nuggets of gold will be coming across. Pay attention. There we go. Any other major takeaways? He rephrased always challenge outcomes by also saying always question results. That's a more common way of saying it, always question results. I also liked you can always answer a question with a question. I know he was poking fun at you during that section, but it's true. If you're seeking greater understanding, Asking a question in response to a question can bring up different aspects that maybe you haven't considered. Yeah, he was correct. I used that technique all the time, which made it so funny. Exactly. I also like the statement about the art of disagreeing without being disagreeable. Right. I'm not sure that he was referencing scenario planning. I think that was a more of a cultural suggestion to us all, but I think something we could easily ingrain into our daily lives. There are so many ways you can apply that both in business and non-business situations. The integrity component came across very strong, specifically with the example of his father. When the teacher was trying to give he and his brother a pass because his father was well-known, his father didn't want that lesson to sink and took a big hit by moving quite a distance with a lesser position. Absolutely. I'm sure that was a really hard thing for their family at the time. Well, let's listen to the next section. Beautiful. So essentially, I was then told that I was promoted. And I was now going to be having much more money, 2,500 pounds a year. It was a monthly salary. I come home, my wife was there, and I told her, she said, when do you get paid? I said, the first of the month. She said, we don't have any money in between. I was living hand to mouth. <laughs> So I told the boss, I can't take the job. He said, why? I said, no money. He said, That's another paradox. You see, the whole concept of uncertainty is the certainty of what you have now and what you don't have. But that's another question for another day. And from there, 
I became an engineer now, full-fledged, and I got into stored program control systems in their research lab. By 1967, there was a great opportunity. My daughter, who had polio, they said the best surgeon for her was in Montreal, Canada. So Montreal, Canada, we went. I got a job with Northern Electric. It's Northern Telecom, Northern Networks, whatever it is right now. I was a systems application engineer. And then through various steps of understanding what stored program was about, I was given an opportunity to be a manager of new product development in 1974. And the labs were looking at, and remember the company I was working for, Nortel, a Canadian company dominated by Western Electric, was a branch of Northern Electric. We were there doing work with Canada under Western Electric licenses. AT&T was God. You followed AT&T or you perished. So I was looking at all this and saying, hey, what do we do? I remember that they had this big executive conference of all Bell Canada top executives to see what new products develop. And they said, is it as good as Western Electric? I said, Western Electric has come out with the latest product which you have, but it's going to be obsolete. And it was because of digital technology. And I, at that time, started studying digital technology and said, digital is the way to go. Stored program, Moore's Law had just come out with more of Intel. And so how do you convince a bunch of executives who have firmly made up their minds that we are second class citizens in Canada, I may have been the most second class of all, <laughs> to tell Western Electric and the gods of 16 Nobel Prize winners in Bell Labs what new technology will bring. So I decided I can't tell these executives, they're all too immersed in themselves. So the first act of a person trying to get somebody's attention is to get it hard. I start, started with this story. The story is very simple. An Englishman stood up in Royal Albert Hall. Those were the days the sun never set on the British Empire. And he said to his audience, gentlemen, by the grace of God, I was born an Englishman. Remember my audience, they were all Scotsmen. They started again and he said, by his grace I've lived on and I hope to die one. Suddenly a wee Scots voice from the back of the room shouted, ah, come on, have you no ambition? <laughs> there was silence for 15 seconds and the whole room burst out with applause. I got my audience. The first step of any speech you ever give in your life get their attention. Make them start listening to you instead of listening to themselves. And so I proceeded to tell them the cost was reducing, analog, the cost was increasing, maintenance costs were reducing the versatility of the performance. Well, from that small, just fast forward in 1979, when I was a vice president at that time, of marketing for the US, which is another story. I was promoted rapidly. The man who had been listening to me asked who should be the next Canadian delegate to the United Nations in telecommunications. He said, the only guy I'd promote is Dave Randall. And I became the Canadian delegate to the United Nations. <laughs> Unexpected. There are three things about this is, again, stories of life. Remember this. Contact making. You say, well, I attend these social gatherings because I want to make contacts. Just because you introduced yourself to somebody is not. You have to. They must know who you are. You must have done them a favor or you may have done them a favor. The first time was when that guy in a small cafeteria was learning Boolean algebra. I got a favor from him because I did something. You know, Gary knows that very well because he told one of my old students whom I ticked off and pushed off, he says, you know how to get Dave's attention? Send roses to his wife. <laughs> Gary is an old pro at this, but I'm just telling you. <laughs> you remember that, Gary? Oh, I remember it well, Dave. <laughs> and then 
I came to the United States. I didn't know much about the United States at all. I was thrust into it. I was told that the Canadians didn't like it at all. They wanted me to stay in Canada so that Canada will be the kingpin. But I moved to here and they decided, the Canadians decided they didn't want the Americans to succeed. So they put the factory in a place called Creedmoor, North Carolina. I learned another lesson as I was touring the United States, trying to sell them telecommunication equipment. A lesson I learned was if you got to sell equipment that is vital to your customers, you better understand your customer's business better than your own. And so I studied regulation, how the telephone company was formed, what was its business model, what drove revenues, what made it so competitive in the marketplace, and that I impact. And so when it came to the biggest discontinuities created in the 1980s, it was a guy called Judge Green, and he had decided he was going to free the charge, penalize the belt and telephone companies, separate it out, put it into two units. And since I understood the value of that business model, I became kind of a spokesman for the Bell Telephone companies, although I was a manufacturer, because I gave talks on that. So much so that I would talk about the future. To study the future, one has to understand and think of how do you look? And that is where I understood that discontinuities for big companies is a torture. Discontinuities for a startup is real meat because discontinuities are opposed to another concept which Yogi Berra gave. Never is a trend more obvious than when it is about to change. He said, don't go by trends. And that is what we were doing at that time with analog. And there have been continuous discontinuities and discontinuities created. Big companies have had to reshape. And so I went through that process and I was a senior vice president of strategic planning for Norton Networks. And the boss wanted to do a different thing and he thought he was in charge of strategic planning. We traveled by company plane at that time and I went to a conference in company plane and then they decided that they would have a big conference with all the major telephone companies without Dave Reynolds. I said, fine, I'll go and do my own thing. This was all the senior executives of all the telephone companies with Edmund Fitzgerald, who was the chairman of the board. The CEOs of Bell companies looked at the list and said, isn't Dave Randall going to speak? They said, no, he's on holiday. They said, why is he on holiday? So the next thing is I get a call from CEO Dwayne Ackham in Bell South. He says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm enjoying the beach. He says, why aren't you at this conference? You think we are not important? I said, come on, guys. I wouldn't be there if I was invited. He said, you were not invited by Northern Telecom? I said, no. He said, wait a minute. He said, the company plane will be picking you up at six o'clock. You are a part of the Bell South delegation. I said, I can't do that. <laughs> they said, we shall inform your CEO that without him, we are not there. And so I went to the North South plane to this conference. My boss was so mad. He said, Dave, we'll look after you. I quit right there. I said, you know, I don't need this headache. Politics is okay, but this takes the cake. What are you going to do to me? That was the second section of Dave Rendell's presentation. What were your takeaways on this, Ryan? There were a couple big ones for me here. One immediately, as soon as he started talking for this section, was the first step of any speech is to get their attention. And he specifically said, make them listen to you, not themselves. It's something that I learned in your class and has behooved me since then in presentations and speeches I've given. I refer to that as the impact statement or the why should they care statement. Sure. Because there's nothing worse than someone getting up in front of a presentation and just starting to drone on, even as simple as starting off to introduce their name and just blandly say what they're about to speak with. And people fall asleep by the time they get to the meet. Especially because in a lot of presentation scenarios, they're not the only presentation. 
So there's been somebody before them or will be somebody after them. And you also notice both this section we just watched and the previous one, he was talking about networking and the importance of networking, which you and I are always banging home about. Yep. He said, contacts must know who you are. You must do them a favor or have them do you a favor. Yes. And he also drove hard on understanding your customers better than your customers know themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sensing some lessons that we've taught in some previous podcasts coming to light here. Definitely. We had done a previous podcast about mentors, and I mentioned that I had a couple of mentors in my life, and Dave was one of my mentors. So it makes sense that the lessons would translate. Some of the things you've heard from the classes were a direct result of Dave being a guiding force in my career. One of the things he spoke about that I thought was really interesting from the world of entrepreneurship, he refers to discontinuities, which you and I referred to as disruptive technologies. But he was talking about the disruptive technology in big companies is torture, or in startups, his quote was, it's the real meat. That's where the opportunities are. Yeah. He also said the discontinuities or trends are most obvious when things are about to change. Yes. And he quoted my favorite American philosopher, Yogi Berra, the famous catcher from the New York Yankees with his yogiisms. And also, too, is if you've been in a political environment, which Dave was thrust in a political environment, how politics can be very disruptive to your career. Absolutely. And he quit over it. That's kind of where we left off. This is where he gets into, he started his own venture. This is where he came into the entrepreneurial side. And he's really about to delve into scenario planning in this next section. But let's listen to it, see what he has to say. So I opened out a shingle in Raleigh, started Rendon and Associates. And I was hired by Bell South to do some work. And suddenly I get a call from Bell South. We want you to meet this guy called Jay Ogilvy. We are going to hire him. The board of directors has hired him. But I have said, without you, that job will not be given. So just talk to them. I don't know if any of you have seen the book by Schwartz. The company he started was Global Business Networks. The head of Global Business Networks was Ogilvy. Ogilvy came down and said, we want you to indulge in scenario planning. I said, what scenario planning? He says, you know, we do this, we get together and we have conversations because these are specialists and they don't understand the world at large very well. So we have these specialists come in and do this. I said, is it called the art of long range planning or art of making money out of ignorant people? <laughs> he laughed, he said, well, uh, a bit of both to be frank. I said, you guys know nothing about telecom and what are you going to do with it? He said, that's what I was told. <laughs> then I realized what he was trying to say. He was an organizer. He wasn't a think tank. It's a method of organizing. Organizing so that experts in different fields who are trying to guide the telephone company into their ideas of what has to be done next. Some with differing opinions. This was a process to get experts together to come to conclusions. So scenario planning was developed primarily by these guys and not only a process of making money out of boards of directors, but it was the ability of someone who didn't know very much is to get the experts articulated and tell them what they know and get them to fight with each other. Share differing opinions. And out of these differing opinions, you get a set of conclusions. And those conclusions drive decision making. So the first thing they did was say, what decisions are you trying to make right now? Are you trying to say whether we should go to the wireless side or the PBX side, whatever technical thing. These guys never understood what they said. They said they wrote it down faithfully. They came to me and said, what would you do? I looked at them and I said, what do you understand about this subject? This is not very much. I said, you're heading this up? They said, yes, we are taking notes. <laughs> I said, oh, you're taking notes, are you? So I said, I'll tell you what. I also look to the future. I also understand this. So 
we started this process, they brought in experts from outside in different fields, from music and arts, believe me that, to politicians. And I was there and I'm listening to these guys. And says, so I said, these guys are making money, why don't I? At the end of the first year in 1989, I think, I made a million dollars. Just out of that one project. These big companies, board of directors had set aside five million dollars for this project. Why should I take my share? <laughs> anyway, I learned the art of scenario planning. I found it relieving at the end that it wasn't a waste of time. It did have substance, that the process yielded a completely better understanding of how to make decisions through alternative scenarios. And these alternative scenarios, surprisingly, turned out to be very simple. They were not complex. You take complexity and make it simple. That's the task. I developed my own after that scenario planning process. They developed their own, which was to get groups and we'd meet every week and talk and speak and do all kinds of things and then come to various conclusions in a group. To me, I looked at it and it says, you know, what's the political scene in Russia? What is the political scene? Does, how does politics affect myself? So to me, the art of scenario planning is an art which is not what they did, but in my mind, and after Gary told me this, I said, if I had to do all this all over again, I would do it differently. I wouldn't use the same assumption sets of collecting. If I collected people, it would be the Delphi principle. And the Delphi principle was very simple. That get these experts, each one of them given the subject of what the decision should be like, or what the picture of the world is like and ask them to make a five minute presentation before the others. All of them not knowing what the other was talking about to start with. So you had eight people around the group and the head of scenario planning would stand up and say, he will make a talk for three to five minutes, telling us what he thinks about the situation of a given decision-making proposal. And then he would say, now each one of you is given one minute after that to ask a question. And if you disagree, that's fine. You don't be disagreeable. You can ask questions, but don't give answers. You just can question them on the validity of their assumptions. So this went around. You ask the first guy, he does it, then the other five guys don't have too big a group, otherwise it's mayhem. You go to the second guy and say, now that you've heard him, what do you think? and then go around the room and then you go back to the first guy and says, having listened to all the arguments the other guys have, have you changed your views? And if you haven't, tell us why. All of a sudden, it's amazing how much unanimity were there on the basic assumptions. There were different opinions stated and you came out with two or three different patterns of scenarios, assumption sets. And then you looked at it and said, okay, now we will make a decision based on a scenario, but we'll always be careful to see if the scenario changes. Make a decision fast, but examine the scenario. The moment the scenario shifts, have the ability to change. The ability to change is a fascinating part of scenario planning, not the ability to make a decision. Because now you understand what the scenario is and what the optimum executive plans have to be done in response to that scenario. Scenarios don't aid in this, they aid in the flexibility of changing your mind. It's totally different from making decisions. I started to more and more appreciate the fact that better decisions you make, make it fast. The world is unknown when you're making. Most of decisions are made. If you know everything, there is no decision to be made. The facts speak for themselves. Decisions made in a period of uncertainty. For example, the U.S. got into war with Japan. They debated it for six months on different scenarios. The certainty was when we were bombed. <laughs> there was no decision to be made after the war. Nobody made that decision. It made itself. You don't want that. 
because then you have to have a reactory process that takes you a long time to change. And so the art of decision making for large corporations is the art of getting specialists together, taking them through this process, creating scenarios fast. Don't spend money, time and energy to, for big corporations. You do it in a month or two, not six months that we did, out of which nothing came up. They were still wanting usage sensitive pricing. And I said, listen, we have changed. The world has changed. There is one fundamental issue, I said. They didn't. I said, we have moved from a world of scarcity, economics of scarcity to the economics of abundance. The value of the previous generation of analog, there was value in scarcity. Gold is scarce, silver is scarce. The thought has value. Although it's useless by itself, it had value. When there are fewer houses, the price of houses go up. More houses, the prices go down. So in abundance, there is no value, there is no value in scarcity. If I had only a million subscribers versus 10 million, 10 million is great, it's free, but free. Abundance provides value in the digital era. That's bluntly said. And today we are looking at an economic value where scarcity has a very small portion of economic wealth in this country. It is abundance. Abundance of what? Abundance of subscribers, abundance of tools, abundance of whatever you want, abundance of Amazon, abundance of distribution. Drives the cost up. No, it drives the cost down. But you have so much goods. That's why most startups in this era lose billions before they make money. It's a different economy. Now, those are the types of scenarios that you base things on. You don't base it on the past. You learn to understand, and we have really done it. What are the fundamental scenarios we would paint today? There would be climate change. There would be globalization. There would be China's predominant entry into this world. COVID-19 is an example. Pandemics, technology. Technology is the most destructive force that we have ever seen, particularly today. Does technology create poverty? According to some, it does, because those who have technology become rich, those who don't have power. So those are the kinds of debates one has. That's how you decide, not by disagreeing, but by having a Delphi process. At the end, you start hearing the other person rather than listening to yourself. And so those are the kinds of things. Climate change, another one. Those are the same carbon. But remember this. We generate more energy consuming, starting from the cell phone. Everybody uses it all the time. The computer, the appliances, all the things that connect the information produce energy. The telephone powers, the x-rays that come out of it. They produce more warmth on the earth than any carbon can do. But there are scientists. But remember what science is. Science is the art of proving the previous generation of scientists wrong. We call it a change of mind. That's the other art of science. So this type of debate is necessary. Not that I'm right or wrong. It is a different point of view, a different scenario as to where the world is going. And so scenario planning is a method in which you collect all these different viewpoints of any business any view of competition and then formulate scenarios and say, well, this is what's going to happen for the next 12 months, but it is going to change. And so you have a bunch of experts guided by a scenario planner who understands this and then he guides them through the process of decision making and then presents alternative viewpoints, which then leads to another conclusion. The process is as important as the conclusion. Those who participate understand better the world around them. The opposing forces, the different scenarios that can happen. That to my mind is what scenario planning should be all about. Thank you. What are your final thoughts with this last section, Ryan? 
Yeah, he really brought it together in this last section. He really highlighted a lot of the key points that he'd already articulated throughout his story in a decision planning way, which was a cool look back on the storytelling model of the speech. So he really focused on challenging outcomes when he challenged his coworkers initially when he was getting into decision making in the very beginning of his career. Yeah, this is a very interesting tool for decision making. Most people are not aware of the concept of scenario planning. Right. But those that are tend to think of it in large corporate. I see applications to it in startups also and in running startup businesses and small to medium-sized enterprises. Absolutely. I think game planning, which is the element that he's talking about, can go a long way. If you're looking at different outcomes throughout the process, you're planning, which is what his expertise is, for each one of those outcomes and steering the boat in the path of least resistance, getting the best outcome you possibly can. Definitely, because otherwise you're just reactive to the situations that happen. Whereas if you're anticipating, you set your plan in place for whatever the potential outcomes can be. Right. We often talk to entrepreneurs of any skill level, and it's a lot of putting out fires. What Dave is trying to get at is you can pre-put out the fires. You can navigate the ship so that you're missing some of those fires. Yeah, definitely. I would encourage any of our listeners to further look into the concept of scenario planning. And by the way, the book he referred to by Schwartz, that's The Art of the Long View, if anyone wants to read it an excellent book about scenario planning. Yeah. I liked that he mentioned technology is the most destructive force we know. You and I just did a podcast on technology and disruption. I think that it's even more now today than it was a year ago and two years ago and 10 years ago, changing the landscape of the way we do business. And I think the beautiful part of it in this current moment is it's really empowering the average person Whereas Dave talked a lot about it really empowering the upper class and creating an even bigger wealth gap. He always amazes me because he's very forward thinking at this point in his career, not reflecting on past successes, but he's still always looking out into the future. It reminds me of an individual I met when I was a very, very young man. His name is Royal Little. He was the founder of Textron Corporation. And he's the father of the conglomerate merger. I met Mr. Little when he was 90 years old, and he was talking about 20 years into the future. Oh, wow. He never lost that foresight. I just love that type of thought process. And Dave, every time I talk to him, he has an understanding of what's coming forward, even though he's not as actively involved in business as he once was. He still is, by the way. Oh, I'm sure. I have no doubt. And I thought it was really interesting, the observation he made about the switch from the scarcity concept to the value of abundance in a digital age. Yeah. Well, he really rode his career through a massive change in times. And clearly he had the foresight then to know what was coming and to do some scenario planning for his own career to get himself situated correctly. And my final thought would be, his comment, and this is to all of our listeners that are looking at starting and driving a business, is the process is as important as the conclusion. What you can learn from the process is so critical. And I think in terms of just the business model canvas, it's not necessarily what the final result is, is what you learned from going through the process that helps you make better decisions as there are issues that are unanticipated, allowing you to pivot much faster. Absolutely. The big thing I kept going back to in my head when he was talking about that was the process is something that's repeatable. That's what we typically focus on with processes. So you're not just doing it once, you're continuously doing it and continuously driving results from that process being repeatable. And so we also encourage individuals don't just sit in a room by themselves or with their partner trying to figure everything out, it's go out and speak with people. And in his particular case, he's addressing experts as a means of gathering information to make a more informed decision, not just what you particularly know at that point in time. That's exactly right. What would be your final conclusion and advice for the listeners of our podcast? 
the big thing that Dave drove home to me was always challenge outcomes and the process of making decisions and looking into the future can change the outcome of where you're going. Excellent. And my final comment is happy birthday to the Let's Get Entrepreneurial podcast. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. You have a good day. You as well. As we wrap up another episode of the Let's Get Entrepreneurial podcast, we extend our gratitude for your presence and attention. Your dedication to the entrepreneurial spirit fuels our passion for creating this podcast. Check out profspirit.com to discover resources and courses designed specifically for innovators like you. Stay on the cutting edge by following us on Spotify, Apple Podcast, YouTube, and other platforms as it is released. Until then, keep the entrepreneurial flame burning.